Perfect. So it is Tuesday, September 13th, 2022, 7.31 p.m. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Daniel Workadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Benkett Holly. Here. Great. Welcome to you all. Glad to have you all here. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valorelli, our board's administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Valorelli. And assisting him, uh, Vincent Lee from Inspectional Services. I think he'll be joining us uh, sooner than later. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, and appearing on behalf of 82 Winter Street would be James Boyle. Will I let him in? Where did he go? He was here a minute ago. I'm sure he'll try to join back in again. Is there anyone else here on behalf of 82 Winter Street? No? Okay. We'll come back to him. Um, then on behalf of nine, is there anyone here for 956 Massachusetts Avenue? And the reason I specifically ask about 956 Mass Ave is that one is going to be withdrawn. Um, so if there's anyone who is here specifically for 956 Massachusetts Avenue, uh, we will not be hearing that this evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a formal request to uh, withdraw that request. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Okay, well, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodation signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. This chair has reserved the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So we have several items on our agenda this evening. I'm going to quickly start with the administrative items. Um, these items relate to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. After introducing each item, I will invite members of the board to provide any comments or questions they may have. And if any members wish to engage in a discussion with other members, please remember to do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself for the record. So with that, um, item number two on our agenda is the approval of the meeting minutes from August 30th, 2022. So these minutes were prepared by Mr. Valorelli and distributed to the board for comment. Um, 
with that, are there any additional comments or questions in regards to the minutes from August 30th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from August 30th, 2022? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. The roll call vote of the board for approval of the minutes from August 30th, 2022. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item three on our agenda this evening, approval of the decision for 24 Grandview Road. Uh, this is a very complex decision written very well by our own Mr. Hanlon. Um, it was distributed to the board for questions and comments, and then a final version was posted to the board again this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 24 Grandview Road? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 24 Grandview Road? Mr. Chairman, so moved. I and second. <laughs> Sorry. Second, Mr. DuPont. Last track. Uh, so roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Rigadelli. Aye. The chair votes aye. That decision is approved. 24 Grandview Road brings us to item four on our agenda, which is the approval of the decision for 49 Valentine Road. 49 Valentine Road. Uh, was a decision also ably written by our own Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and then a final version posted to the board uh, this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 49 Valentine Road? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 49 Valentine Road? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Am I have a second? second? Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, we'll call vote of those uh, Voting on the original hearing, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the written decision for 49 Valentine Road is approved, which brings us to item five on our agenda. Uh, approval of the written decision for 3335 Varnum Road. This was well written by our own Mr. DuPont um, and distributed to the board for questions and comments. And the final version was posted uh, this afternoon are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 3335 Varnum Road? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 3335 Varnum Road? So moved. I, I, I thought I'd let Mr. Mr. DuPont have a <laughs> shot at this one. So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> So uh, vote of those voting on the original decision for 3335 Varnum Street. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That decision is approved for 3335 Varnum Street, which brings us to item number six on our agenda, the vote, the approval of the decision for 101 Robbins Road. Uh, this was a decision that I wrote, distributed to the board for questions and comments and posted a final version to the board this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 101 Robbins Road? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 101 Robbins Road? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank Second. you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So, vote of the board to approve the written decision for 101 Robbins Road. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that is a written decision for 101 Robbins Road is approved. That concludes the administrative items portion of tonight's agenda. Um, I'll just reiterate for people who may have joined the meeting um, after the very start. Uh, the hearing for 756 Massachusetts Avenue um, will be withdrawn. The applicant is withdrawing because it, the application actually needs to run through the ARB and not the ZBA. Uh, so we will only be uh, voting tonight to accept the withdrawal. So um, that was the only reason you're on tonight's meeting. Uh, you can feel free to, uh, to log off. 
So now turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce the agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. Then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, Brings us to item seven on our agenda this evening, which is docket number 3713, 82 Winter Street. So I would ask the applicant to please introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Mr. Boyle. Hi. This Good evening, Boyle. Mr. Boyle. Hi. What, what do you need from me? Uh, so if you could just give us a brief introduction to uh, what you would like to do and if there's anyone else um, representing you on the on the meeting okay. this evening. Uh, I'm representing myself, no one else. Uh, the reason being to convert the accessory dwelling, which was my garage, into a ground level living space area Due to a number of health issues, hot condition, kidney condition, uh, and several other conditions. Uh, that is the real reason we want to do this uh, to move into the garage as a single level because I'm unable to go up and down 17, eight, 17 steps every day to the second floor level of my current home. Uh, that's the big reason why I have to do it. You know, I want to remain in place. In Arlington, I've been there for a lot of years. So, right. is something wrong? No. Oh. No, but I'm just so, uh, I'm showing the application that you filed. Oh. oh. <laughs> so this this is the application. Um, so it's a request for a special permit to uh, create an accessory dwelling unit in an existing garage um, yes. property. It's, it's an existing building a structure that's been there since, it, well, since I owned the property. And the picture you're seeing right now is what it's gonna look like at the front. And as you can see in this drawing, where the garage is located, uh, front, rear yeah, uh, setback, inside yard yeah, setback. Uh, it's all I can really tell you. I can't read read it myself right now, but so kind of focus in a little bit. Yeah. So this is the garage here. Yes. The rear of the property, uh, residential properties on two sides, the commercial property here, and there's uh, apartments across Winter Street. Right. Well, as you can see, the structure itself is it's a block building and it's been there since the house was built back in 1925. So, you know, I'm not adding on to it. I'm not taking away from it. I just want to convert it to a habitable living space for myself because it helped me. Okay. And the um, so as a part of the accessory dwelling unit bylaw, the access the dwelling is the building in is the current house in single ownership or is it condo? Yeah, it's a no wood which wood built on a uh, block foundation. And but is it is there a single owner for both units in the current house or? Yeah, I'm okay. the sole owner of the whole property. Got it. Okay. There's no mortgage or nothing on it. Okay. So this is the proposed plan. Yeah, that's approximately what it's going to look like inside. Uh, layout furnished. Again, this is the property in the opposite direction, but very similar. Um, the existing house and the existing garage. So 
So this falls under um, So it falls under the accessory dwelling units, which is a section of the zoning bylaw that was adopted um, in 2021. Um, and it sets up a series of requirements uh, for an accessory dwelling unit. And particular to us is uh, bullet five, which allows for the an accessory dwelling unit to be within um, essentially a, an accessory building provided that such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals acting pursuant to six, section 3.3 grants a special permit upon its finding that the creation of such an accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. And so that is the determination that the, the board is uh, requested to make this evening. Um, and then in the, there's a, a separate section, um, which is uh, 813E. Um, the creation or addition of accessory dwelling unit within an existing dwelling or within an existing accessory building on the same lot as any such dwelling does not increase or affect the non-conforming nature of said existing dwelling or accessory building and shall not cause such dwelling or accessory building to become non-conforming or result in any additional dimensional requirements with respect to such dwelling or accessory building, provided that such creation or addition of an accessory dwelling unit not in um, neither expands the footprint nor the height of said dwelling or accessory building in each case except one for the changes necessary to provide for required egress or other modifications to meet the building code or state fire code two for any projects allowed under 539 which is the section we read uh, the section that involves additions um, in setbacks and then section Three to the extent authorized by a special permit issued pursuant to clause three of section 592B1, the fifth bullet, which was what we had read prior. Uh, so those are the relevant sections of the bylaw. Um, and then the applicant, there are a couple of additional um, documents that came forward. Where did I put that? Nope, that one, not that one. I'll put it, maybe I'll have it up. Let's see. Oh, I thought I had this up again. Pardon? I thought I'd open everything. Street. The memorandum. Have you seen the memorandum right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is the memo that was issued by the Department of Planning and Community Development um, in regards to this application. Um, but I was looking for. Ah, this is here it is. Um, so this is additional information that we were asked to include. Um, so one was a color rendering showing uh, the house upon completion of the work. So this is the existing garage, um, basically with the existing garage door removed and the, the front facade redone. Um, and then there are elevations. So left and front, rear and right. And then again, the this is the floor plan is shown in the reference to which the, is the directions. So 
with that, um, are there questions uh, from the board in regards to this application? Do I have any questions? Oh, is it members of the members of the board have questions for you? Uh, I really don't understand what you're saying on the question. Um, you know, Mr. Boyle, I was asking if there were members of the zoning board who had questions they had wanted to ask of you. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Where I'm at, it's kind of noisy. I'm at the they do not. So. Okay. So if there are no direct questions at this time from members of the board, I will go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Um, so just remind the comment that public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Place. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks those waiting, those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions and comments are to be addressed through the chair and please remember to speak clearly. Uh, once all public questions and comments have been addressed, uh, the public comment period will be closed and I will do my best to show any documents requested um, as we go forward. So with that, uh, we have uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, one question relative to uh, parking. I know that uh, I'm just, this is probably due to my ignorance. I'm, I'm not sure how the, uh, the ADU press. Mm -hmm. Bylaw and regulations with parking issues. Um, I know this is a two family home. A, a dwelling unit could eventually be kind of a three family home. And I, I'm wondering what about parking that might be increased? It's, it's more an educational question to me than anything. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, so the the bylaw that authorizes accessory dwelling units, um, I'm just trying to find the right portion of it. It does not require the creation of a parking space for the accessory dwelling unit. Uh, I apologize, I don't know this section immediately off the top of my head here. All right, well, well, answer, actually, Mr. Chairman, that kind of, answer, that kind of answers my question, um, that even though, even though there'll be a decrease in parking spaces due to the removal of a garage space, um, you don't, maybe you, you don't have to increase parking to compensate, I, I guess. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? I just wanted to note for the record that when you when you go by the property, the driveway is actually fairly ample. We don't have the front front and the building is actually quite close to the street. So you don't have the problem of parking in a front yard that vexed us last time. Um, so there is there is room there for off street parking and and so the could some of that considerable amount of that is being used as things stand now. Um, so regardless of, of what the bylaw says, it's also, it's also true that you're not dealing with a property that is so filled up that there's no place to park the front, front yard. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Um, this being the hearing in regards to 8082 Winter Street. Going once, going twice. Uh, the public comment period for this hearing um, is now closed. With that, we return back to um, the question before us. So 
what we have is an application to convert an existing garage into an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, this is sort of the first one of, we sort of had something similar to this recently, uh, but this is the first sort of true application for an accessory dwelling unit in an accessory building. So I just wanna sort of carefully go through the bylaw to make sure that we're covering all our bases with this. So I'll go ahead and bring this up. So this is the section 592, the principal section for accessory dwelling units. Um, so under requirements um, in any residential or business district, an accessory dwelling unit is permitted as an accessory use for single family dwelling, two family dwelling or duplex dwelling, if all of the following conditions are met. And we do have in this case, this is an existing two family on the property. Uh, so it would be allowed and it's within the residential district. So the first bullet point, um, accessory dwelling unit should not be larger in floor area than one half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is smaller. Um, so Mr. Valorelli, in this case, would the floor area relate to the entire building that it's adjacent to, or does it is it just to one floor of the building adjacent to it? The entire building to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman, so this is new territory for all of us. Yep. But uh, it seems that Mr. Boyle is requesting uh, only that the structure is less than six feet off the property line. Okay. So the existing growth floor area of the building is listed as 4,672. And the proposed gross floor area of the accessory dwelling unit is 306 square feet. So obviously it's well below um, below that. That's how I see it as well, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you, Mr. Valerelli. Uh, bullet point number two is any alteration causing an expansion or an addition to a building in connection with an accessory dwelling unit. So that does not apply. Uh, bullet number three, accessory dwelling unit shall maintain a separate entrance, either directly from the outside or through an entry hall or shared corridor. So this has a, its own separate entrance door, as we saw that's on the front facing the street. Uh, Bullet point number four, no more than one accessory dwelling unit is allowed per principal dwelling unit. So currently there are two principal dwelling units because it's a two family and this will be the first ADU on the property. So that condition is met. Um, then the bullet five, accessory dwelling unit can be located in number three, an accessory building, which is a which accessory building shall not constitute a principal or main building by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit, which is true, provided that if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals acting pursuant to section six, excuse me, section three three, grants a special permit upon its finding that the creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood then the use of such accessory building as a private garage or allowed use. Uh, so that is a determination that we will have to make. Uh, bullet six, an accessory dwelling unit shall not be used as short-term rental in accordance with Title V, Article 18, Section 3 of the bylaws. Um, and as the applicant stated that it is, um, it is there is an occupant who will be uh, taking a long-term residence. Uh, so this is not a condition, this is not an issue. Um, and then bullet seven, that an accessory dwelling unit shall be subject to all applicable requirements of the state building code and state fire code, including any such requirements if and as applicable which prohibit openings, including windows and exterior walls of dwellings located within a certain distance from the property line. Uh, so this is something that the inspectional services department will evaluate and rule on when they do their, uh, their building code review. Um, And then, so those are the conditions. So we will need to uh, decide that we have, I, it appears that all the conditions have been met with, the only question is, are, is number five, which we should discuss further. Um, and then the other parts are um, less for, are not a part of those requirements. Um, so the accessory dwelling unit shall not change the zoning classification that is 
just this will remain in a two family building, even though there is a third unit on the lot. Uh, number three, no off street parking spaces are required, as we discussed earlier. Uh, number four, accessory dwelling unit shall not be owned separately from the principal dwelling unit. Um, so it cannot be sold off as a separate condominium. And for the administration portion um, is not uh, for us. The administrative portion is for inspectional services. Um, it's administrative. Are there any questions in regards to um, the requirements as put forth in the zoning bylaw? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So I actually um, would like to go back up to A1, the purpose, and I'm yep. only doing it because it's so new and I think that context is important and I know that we'll be dealing with more of these as time goes on. And so I, I just want to make sure that I, I have it um, in, in the correct perspective. So I, I know it starts out by saying, you know, allowing property owners with an opportunity to age in place, which is, I think, exactly what the applicant is, is saying. And then it references elderly and disabled, et cetera. And he may also qualify under those terms as well. Um, but I have an interest in knowing, because once you look at that, and I think that would cover Mr. Boyle, um, but once you go down, and I realize that C1 is really an administrative issue with the, uh, with the building department, but um, just because it's so new again, mm -hmm. is the only statement that an applicant has to make that he or she is going to reside in the accessory dwelling unit and are we ever making any inquiry whatsoever into the rest of the building? And the reason I'm asking is, assuming that you have a building where you're living in the main building, and then you decide for whatever set of reasons that comport with uh, A1 that you want to move into the accessory dwelling unit, do we care? Do we inquire as to who's going to be in the portion of the main building that you're vacating. And I guess that's really just, you know, for perspective again, because obviously we need to make sure that the purpose that's uh, recited in A1 is actually being met. And in this case, I think, it is. but are we ever, if somebody moves into the accessory dwelling unit, do we ever look to see who's going to be in the rest of the building that's being uh, vacated? No, um, so I don't know if, if Mr. Hanlon wants to comment on this too. Uh, during the discussion at town meeting, uh, very clearly the intent is that the resident can live in the main house and rent out the accessory dwelling unit to support their income, or the main awesome. resident can live in the accessory dwelling unit and rent out the remainder of the house um, for income or other purposes. So it, it doesn't really matter which who lives in which, as long as they're in common ownership and the owner is in one of the units. Um, and so what this, what this will mean is that uh, specifically for this property, if in the future this property is sold and a new owner decides they would like to condo the building and sell off the main units separately, they can do that. But upon doing so, they have to designate the accessory dwelling unit to one of the two units, and whoever purchases it has to reside there um, in either the main unit or that accessory dwelling unit. But as soon as the property is subdivided, that unit has to be assigned to one of the units. It can't be. Well, the reason, again, I'm asking is when I look at C1, and this maybe is not a discussion that affects the current application, but it does say that the affidavit has to state that the owner or a family member of the owner is going to reside in the principal dwelling unit or accessory unit. And I know that the discussion we had on the prior case involved, uh, you know, the people who lived in the home wanting to have one of their parents move in. So that seemed to be tailor made for that. But there does seem to, at least in the first instance, be a requirement that it is going to either be a family member or, or the owner residing there. And, and I know, you know, 
I, I know this may be angels on the head of a pen and I'm not, I don't want to make this longer than it needs to be, but I just want to make sure that going forward, I have an understanding of what the requirements are. So you're saying, Mr. Chairman, that the, as long as the um, owner lives in the accessory dwelling unit, we're not really going to inquire beyond that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So I just want to be clear from what the chair said before is that the owner has to live in one or the other. Uh, an owner who has no connection with the tenant in the, uh, in the affordable dwelling unit other than collecting rent, that's still fine. Okay. And that's actually one of the purposes that's listed uh, up above in A1. What this is aimed at is attempting to kind of create, avoid creating a kind of a market in affordable dwelling units so that people are speculating in this and building them in the hope of having someone in where there's no relationship necessarily whatever to either of the units on the part of the people who are who are doing the work. Um, but at this point, the only thing that really matters, and it isn't really our problem particularly because most of these cases are going to be done by right, uh, but it's Mr. Champa needs to have an affidavit of, of this kind before issuing a building permit. You also notice that it's before issuing a building permit so that the statute does not really address what happens later on after that affidavit is filed, and I'm assuming it's accurate, but times change. Uh, there isn't an ongoing requirement even of the ownership of one of the of one of the two units. Um, so it's it's an effort. It was an, it was a compromise to begin with, and it's an effort to sort of try to take this outside the general area of commerce and turn it into sort of ordinary relations between people um, without unduly burdening the ability to uh, to do all this through a number of other proposals that were made and rejected by town meeting. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Are there further questions from the board? Seeing none, I will revert back to the um, planning department memo. Let's see if I can figure out which one it is. That one. Um, so there's a memorandum prepared by the uh, planning department uh, to assist the board in sort of interpreting the zoning bylaw. Um, and one of the things they do is they review the special permit criteria under section 333, which is a requirement for the board to do uh, for this application, in addition to finding that um, that the creation of the accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of the accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Um, so as we had we had reviewed the other requirements before, so this was bullet five. So I just wanted to go through these criteria. Uh, so criterion number one, the requested use. Uh, requested use is permitted through a special permit in the R2 zoning district. Since the existing accessory structure is located less than six feet from the property line. So we are in an R2 district. It's a two family house. The accessory dwelling unit is allowed up to two accessory dwelling units. And because it is in an accessory building and within six feet of the property line, a special permit is required in order for it to be approved. So it can be approved. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes, Mr. Mr. So Mr. I wonder if this is, this is a convenient way of addressing something that I think it's important for us to be clear on. Um, and that is, it's, it's only because the existing structure is located less than six feet from the property line uh, that the applicant has to come to us at all. Um, that this is not this is not really an 8.1.3 issue. There is no extension of a nonconformity here, uh, and because section 8.1.3e says so explicitly. So the only source of any of the obligations that the that that the applicant is solving by coming to us is 5.9.2, the fifth bullet that we read, which both requires a special permit and requires a, uh, 
uh, a finding of of that of not substantially more detrimental. So all of this, you don't need to go outside the framework of 5.9.2, and you shouldn't be actually because there's no real difference in treatment between a new garage and one that already exists from the point of view of 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 that section. If you'll remember when we dealt with the earlier case, the first case that come up came up here, our big problem was that it wasn't an accessory building, uh, but an attempt but to build an addition too close to the lot line. And one of the solutions that we explored in the hearing at that point was why, well, couldn't you make it an accessory building? Uh, and that's what would happen if the applicant here didn't already have a garage, but was planning to build one. Um, so it, just because this is the first time, it's really clear to get your doctrinal basis right. And I think that the discussion of Article 1.0 uh, even though it doesn't in substance lead to a different conclusion, the, the discussion of 8.1.3 might be a little bit confusing. And I, I, I think we should be clear that that's not where we're looking. We're looking at 5.9.2 instead. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. So as Mr. Hanley said, 5.9.2 specifically references meeting their criteria of section 333, so that's what we're reviewing now. We've done criteria one. So criteria number two um, is a public convenience and welfare. So this proposal would provide an accessory dwelling unit to allow the owners to age in place. Um, so this Mr. unit, Mr. Hanlon? Mr. Chairman, I, at, at the risk of, I, as far as I'm concerned, what Mr. DuPont pointed out to begin with, the statutory policy in favor of fostering ADUs is, is applicable here. And it's applicable regardless of why the owner wants it. So mm -hmm. I'm quite sympathetic to the idea of aging in place. I'm doing a lot of aging and I'm spending a lot of time in place myself. So I feel a great deal of sympathy with that. But uh, the fact is, is that if the answer was it would provide an ADU to allow the owners to collect rent from college students to support their house, that would be just the same. It doesn't, the, the, the statute doesn't distinguish among this or th that use and say one is a good use and the other is not. So the important thing here is that the statute, for lots of reasons, furthers that. And there's nothing going on here that is inconsistent with the uh, statement of purpose that Mr. DuPont pointed out. Right. Thank you, Mr. Henley. Uh, criteria number three, undue traffic congestion impairment of public safety. Uh, there would not be an undue increase in traffic congestion or impairment to public safety. Uh, this is a, a, essentially an existing garage structure. There is a possibility this might increase the count of vehicles by one. Should the resident have a the resident of the accessory dwelling unit have a vehicle, um, but that is a a small increase on a you know on a large street, especially one that has a commercial operation on one side and an apartment complex on the other side. So. Um, criteria number four, undue burden on municipal systems would not be an undue burden on municipal systems. This would be the addition of essentially one restroom and uh, one bathroom and one kitchen and would not be an undue burden. Um, brings us to criteria number five, the special regulations. So if granted the special permit proposal would meet the required conditions of ADUs uh, in 592B1. So we had reviewed these earlier um, which is the, the bullet points from the prior section. Uh, criteria number six, uh, the integrity character of the district detrimental to health, morals, and welfare. Um, so as written by the, um, by the planning department, while the accessory building, excuse me, is located less than six feet from the abutting properties, Proposal to create an ADU is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use as a garage or another allowed use. The property abuts the B4 zoning district, vehicular oriented business to the north, and excuse me, is across the street from apartments in the R5 zoning district. Additionally, three family homes are located in the R3 zoning district to the northeast. The accessory building is located entirely in the rear yard of the property. The facade improvements are designed to complement the style of the primary dwelling and adjacent homes in the neighborhood. Additional window details and new egress improve the compatibility of the structure with the surrounding neighborhood. And staff note the proposed elevation and plans are not consistent 
However, overall, this proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the neighbors to the property. Um, and what the what they were pointing out with in, in terms of the drawing inconsistency is the, the color image of the front of the building shows a window to the right of the entry door where there is not a window in the plan. Um, and I, the board would just need to discuss how they, I think we would need to condition um, that should we choose to vote this evening. Um, and then criteria seven, uh, detrimental excess in particular use. This would not be any detrimental excesses. This would effectively be the first accessory dwelling unit in an accessory building in the entire town. So um, would not be an excess. <clears throat> Those are the criteria. Are there any questions in regards to those or um, question as to whether the board, uh, if there's any specific feelings about whether um, this accessory dwelling unit by, by grant of its location would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of a private garage. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wonder if the chair could inquire of Mr. Boyle, which of the two proposals uh, in terms of the windows is what he actually promote, proposes to submit to us? Is, well, is it the extra that. window or not? I'll go ahead and bring that up. So the, this is the plan, um, which has two windows on the front and a door it's hard to see. There's a, a window shown here um, in yellow because it's a it's a half height window up high, uh, and then there's a window on the rear. But if we so this is the right side view with that window, the rear view with the window, the front view with the door, and the two windows. But the image had shown three windows on the front on one side and one on the other. So I just so Mr. Boyle, the question is. Um, is the arrangement of doors and windows as shown on these elevations that were submitted on the 8th of September, is that what your intention is? Actually, uh, we're still undecided. I think we're gonna go with the two windows and the door, and that's it. Okay. Is it, is it, from my perspective, there are too many windows, uh, but, the window in the bedroom will be a uh, emergency exit window. Okay. And then on the kitchen side, there'll be a uh, just basically for sunlight on the other side of the house. Okay. That's pretty much it. Okay. So in about an hour, you're sort of winding down. So the so the revised images that we were shared. Um, that are dated okay. nine eight. We can reference those specifically as being the. Images. That would be the choice. Thank you. Um, there was one other thing I had wanted to just recommend to the applicant. Um, sorry. Um, so in this, so currently the way it's laid out, um, the entry door overlaps the refrigerator. Yes. And just thinking longer term, um, should your mobility be restricted and you're uh, in a wheelchair, it might be difficult to navigate around the corner of the fridge. I don't know if you would consider moving the door over slightly to give yourself a little bit more of a straight uh, access to the door. Just uh, I was going to make long term. Any, everything handicapped accessible, uh, even if I've broken my leg twice already. Mm -hmm. I know it's like trying to get around a wheelchair and crutches. So everything will be outdoors will be a handicap width requirement. Uh, so this here is going to need to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, I've already spoken to the architect about it. So he's willing to work with me on the interior. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair, may I, I ask have one question? Mr. Riccadelli, uh, please. I just wonder um, if the applicant could uh, confirm that the, the height of the building isn't changing. I know I know the 
extents of the uh, garage are remaining the same. But I just wonder if the uh, ceiling needed to be raised in order to accommodate. Um, Mr. Boyle, is there any change in the height of the building? No. No. There will be no changes at all to the exterior of the building other than where the windows are. It's Perfect. only Thank anything that's going to change. Great. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Uh, I have no questions. I mean, I'm here to answer them. Whatever you need. Okay. So, um, so for the zoning board so if we when we approve if we were to vote to approve um there are conditions that we would apply um so the first the three standard conditions which i'll go ahead and, and read now and we'll we can sort of address this um so number one is the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Condition number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that he is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he deems that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, so our standard number one sort of indicates that the, you know, the plans submitted are the final plans. Um, but as, the, as was noted by the, um, the there were some questions about exactly what the plans included um, by the planning department. So I, I'm wondering if we want to uh, just include the statement that the, the plan and elevations that were submitted to the board on September 8th will be the, the guiding documents. So the floor plan and exterior elevations dated September 8th, 2022 shall be the plan for the project. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? So I have a question. The suggestion that the chair made earlier about some rearrangements inside uh, with the inside layout of rooms and, and refrigerators and so on in order to uh, make sure that, that this is accessible as one's mobility gets less. Um, the applicant indicated that he needed a certain amount of flexibility to make that work, that those are not final. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've never really interpreted the final plans requirement that we usually use as binding applicants to a particular arrangement of the rooms inside the house, except insofar as that may have to do with the half story requirement uh, in, in some occasions. Uh, and I assume that that you know, if the applicant wanted to move the refrigerator that he could do that. Um, I guess the question is whether there's enough flexibility for him to move the door a little bit to give himself some extra to room and what we need to say in order to allow him to do that without necessarily having to rendezvous with us again. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was looking at the plans, the, the location of the doors and windows is not dimensioned. And so Sort of in my mind, as long as you know they're still in the relative positions, they're in keeping with the plans. Um, okay. I don't, does that sit well with folks? To me, it does. It, it okay. helps. Are there other conditions that the? Thank you, Mr. Mills. Are there other conditions the board would consider? trying to think if there's anything specifically related to dwelling units that we would want to include as a condition, but there's nothing that comes to mind. 
Mr. Chairman, the, the statute itself has got quite a lot in it and mm -hmm. doesn't need our help, I guess. Uh, all of those things will have to be ob observed. Okay. All right, so with that, uh, are there any last questions or comments from the board? Okay, uh, then I would ask for a motion um, on this hearing. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the uh, application be approved subject to the standard conditions and the uh, uh, revision that the chair proceeded, uh, mentioned before and read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So what the board has before it is a motion to approve the special permit for 82, uh, I guess it's 80-82 Winter Street um, with four conditions, those being the three standard plus the one uh, additional. So any questions from the board about the nature of the vote? Seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The special permit for 8082 Winter Street is approved with the four conditions. Thank you very much for your application, Mr. Boyle. You. Um, are approved, you will need to follow up with Mr. Valarelli and the board will uh, vote on a, the written decision for your application at the next meeting. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, when is the next meeting actually? Do we have one and another one in September or are we waiting until October? So, um, oh, Mr. Valarelli and I were just talking about this right before the call. So there are two items which were, which we believe were advertised for the 27th. Um, Mr. Valarelli does not believe that the applicants are actually ready to present. And so that is being evaluated by, um, by him. And if he feels they're ready, then we will, um, we will hear those on the 27th. If not, we will still need to meet on the 27th if only to uh, continue them to believe October 11th is the following date. I see. So th that means that we'll probably, if we're going to meet, this will take very little time, I think, to mm -hmm. actually vote on the opinion. The administrator these usually don't. So basically, we should be counting on being able to take action and let, let Mr. Boyle go forward on the 27th. That is correct. Okay. So that brings us up to our next item on our agenda, which is number eight, which is docket 3714, 956 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, so as I alluded to earlier, um, so this is an application to change uh, graphics on a sign and replace a sign. Uh, uh, when the zoning bylaw was revised back, I think it was in 2020 with the new sign bylaws a part of the zoning bylaws that um, all sign applications would go initially to the planning department where they would be issued uh, where they would either be administratively approved or if there were issues that needed to be resolved then it would go and be referred to the redevelopment board and not to the zoning board of appeals and the reasoning at the time was that it made much more sense for one board in town to be hearing all of the sign applications rather than some being heard by one board and some being heard by another. Uh, and so in when this application was uh, provided to us, um, I inquired back with the planning department and with inspectional services. And uh, we are all in agreement that this really should be going through the redevelopment board. And so therefore, Mr. Valarelli asked the applicant if they would uh, agree to withdraw without prejudice. Um, and so this is their email requesting uh, withdrawal for the application without prejudice. Um, are there any questions from the board in regards to this? 
with that, may I have a motion to accept the withdrawal application, the withdrawal of the application for 956 Massachusetts Avenue without prejudice. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hannon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, so a roll call vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. The chair votes aye, so that uh, application is withdrawn. Thank you for that. Um, so that is the last item on our agenda this evening. Um, as we discussed briefly before, um, there are two cases that might come before us on the 27th of, of September, but at this time we're not sure if those applications will, are, will be prepared in time. With that in mind, um, they would then be moved to October 11th. Otherwise, uh, we will be hearing them on the 27th. We'll have on the 27th, we will have to meet to continue those, and we will probably vote on minutes and vote on uh, the decision for Winter Street. And then the only other bit of non, well, I guess non news at this point is the comprehensive permit application for 1021 1027 Massachusetts Avenue has still not been filed. Um, so we've gained a little bit more time on that. Um, but I anticipate that they will be filing at some point soon. With that, that's all the business we have for this evening. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. And I especially would like to thank Rick Ballarelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linema, and Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. And it is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. So Chairman. Oops. Oh, Mr. Moore. Before you adjourn, I just want to make one comment, please. I Mr. Want, Moore, please. I want to congratulate the board for the first successful sort of standard AD2 application and approval process. Oh, well, thank you. Five year long haul for the town and, and this is like the first one. So I just want to give you a hand if I could. So. <laughs> well, thank thank you. you very much. Appreciate that. Now with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Roll call vote of the full board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Good night, Thank everyone. Everybody. Good night. Good night. See you soon. Bye. Bye.